in 2017, where are we in terms of disease prevention? Um, how do we prevent this disease in the first place? Uh, Pre-exposure prophylaxis, how do, we, how do we deal with that? So we spent a lot of time with voluntary counseling and testing, invested billions of dollars in the richest country in the world, and the number of new infections is estimated to be essentially unchanged in the United States over the last decade or so more. So you're saying it's a bust? Well, you could argue it started, maybe it's, it's, it's better. It's, it's starting to come down. Yeah, it but you could, and you could argue down. it could have been a lot worse sure. had we not made the okay. investment. Okay. Okay. But right. it wasn't enough. Right. If we're still having forty to fifty thousand new infections a year, so it wasn't enough. So people started looking at biologic ways to manage this that doesn't require entirely people changing behavior. Okay. So we always look to vaccines, and so far vaccines have been a bust. Okay. Your well, taxpayer then, dollars at so work. So then the next big <laughs> step, and we actually learned this over 20 years ago in preventing pregnant women from transmitting to their baby, is using antiretrovirals. Okay. And I think the two big advances that have had a big impact globally now is the recognition that when we treat somebody with HIV and suppress their virus, the risk of them transmitting to their partner is extraordinarily small. That's so because it, the actual particle count is nil. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right, sure. So that's been the that's been by far the biggest advance in prevention. I mean, it is virtually a hundred percent protective, based on the data that's available. If somebody's on therapy and their virus is suppressed, and, so and in fact, in in several cities where a high proportion of people are on therapy, the number of new infections has dropped. Okay. So, so that's that's so, the, so that's you know, population. Yeah, right. So let me get San Francisco, to San Francisco being. I One of the, the most yeah. notable London and yeah. New York. Well, and let's hit a couple of quick bullet points. Women trying to conceive, can they be prophylaxed? Oh. So there's, I think there's two ways to look at this. So you're assuming now the male partner is HIV infected and the woman is uninfected. Okay. And they're trying to conceive and have a biologic child. There's yes. lots of pieces to this, right? Yes. Because there are alternative means in which one could accomplish this feat. But to have a biologic <laughs> child, the we're talking about. The old-fashioned way. Yeah, old you want to do it the old-fashioned way. So, you know, the first step, based on the data that's available, is if the male partner's viral load is undetectable and has been for at least six months, the likelihood of them transmitting to the partner should be virtually zero. Okay, so the bullet point on that is you treat the male partner. That's the most important. Okay. By far. What about unborn children, prophylaxis? Well, it's just a prevention of HIV from mother to child. We, we know how to do that. You treat the mother. Okay. Treat the mother, treat the mother, treat the mother. And, and, and in, you know, in, I don't know what it's like in Massachusetts yeah. or Pennsylvania, but in North Carolina, you know, maybe one transmission a year or two uh, in, in the entire state well, from remarkable. mother to that's, child. I mean, it's, yeah. it's gone away. Pediatric HIV is, is it's done. It's amazing. I would like to point out that when I said it was a bust, that was before you said that. Right. Well, that's huge. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it'd be people who specialize in pediatric HIV need to find a new specialty. <laughs> <laughs> the whole network needs to find a yeah. new thing to do. <laughs> okay. I, right. I will we'll say one, one, one thing. It is, is, is still an open research question, is that what is the safest treatment to give the pregnant women? Right, that, that's okay. not and that, clear. That, right? we, can, we can prevent transmission of HIV, but the, the babies born to HIV-infected moms who don't get HIV themselves appear to have health issues, and we're not sure whether it's they're getting some toxicity from the drugs or who knows what, so that's okay. still not, sure. not an answer. Can, can, can we, can, I, very just, briefly, it's really important. I, to, I, I, I know it's brief, but, but we, pre-exposure prophylaxis, yeah. PrEP, we just yeah. have to mention PrEP, because if a lot of people that are out there listening to this are primary care doctors, what Eric was trying to say about using antiretrovirals in those very high-risk groups that Ian mentioned, the men who have sex with men, injection drug users, which is going way up, right? There, I mean, I was just on service. With all this, you know, endocarditis again, that's like back in the battle days. Just rem remember PrEP. People, you know, remember PrEP, right? Yeah. Okay. And that's, okay, for, that's for the masses, right? So first I talked about what the million two in the United States can do to prevent from transmitting to their partners. PrEP is really for the millions and millions of uninfected people right. okay. that allow them to protect themselves. And it's, and it's a reason why people may want to volunteer and get tested. I got it. Because if individuals know that they're at risk for acquiring HIV, and if they're aware that there's a way that they can be, prevent becoming infected by taking a pill a day, right. then that's incentive to be, te to be tested to find out you're negative and then to request PrEP. Okay, what about post-exposure prophylaxis, and this is of particular interest, of course, to healthcare providers, yeah. but anybody who suddenly finds out, oh my gosh, I was exposed, what so, do you do? So, so we give, um, give 28 days, four weeks of therapy. Um, 
you know, in the occupational exposures, it makes sense. It probably works. We give it also to people who have, for example, sexual assaults. In that setting, I think a lot of what we're doing is just trying to do something rather than nothing, because mm -hmm. often we don't know the source patient has infection at all. So there's, a, I think, a tremendous amount of over-treatment for post-exposure prophylaxis. Nonetheless, we do it. It is endorsed in the guidelines, and it's probably one of the reasons why, at least occupational exposures, there has not been occupationally transmitted HIV in this country for, for decades. It's decades. Right. Yeah. And it's, and it's the, the advance is that now it's safe and well-tolerated. Yeah. You know, Used to be. 20 years ago, you're taking Zidovidine, yeah. AZT every four hours, you're vomiting, and, and, right. and now it's like, it's really- So all my residents who get a needle, needle yeah, stick they, and they, they panic, yeah, right, right. I can quote yeah. them, you. Yeah. yeah, you can say there has not been an occupational exposure that has led to HIV acquisition in the United States in decades.